Hi, I'm Carl Weber. Welcome to Video Aided Instructions English Grammar Series. In this program, we'll be discussing the art of agreement. Think of a sentence as being like a machine made up of various kinds of parts. A sentence, of course, is made up of parts called words. We give them names like noun, verb, pronoun, adjective, adverb, and so on. These are the parts of speech. Of course, the parts of a machine must be carefully chosen to fit together. You wouldn't want to put the transmission from an 82 Chevrolet into a 96 Honda, not if you wanted the car to run properly. In the same way, the parts that are chosen to fit into a sentence must be carefully selected to work together properly. In grammar, this is known as the principle of agreement. In this program, we'll look at some of the most common problems with grammatical agreement. You'll learn some simple rules for making sure that the sentences you write obey the principle of agreement. Follow these rules, and the sentences you write will hum like a well-tuned engine. Ready? Let's begin. The first kind of agreement that's important for you to understand is agreement between subjects and verbs. And when we're dealing with subjects and verbs, the most important kind of agreement has to do with singular and plural. Let's start with the basic rules for understanding this kind of agreement. First, what does singular and plural refer to? Singular words refer to one person, place, thing, or idea. Here are a few examples of singular words. Woman, village, kayak, time. Each of these refers to one person, place, thing, or idea. A woman is a person, a village is a place, a kayak, which is a kind of boat, is a thing, and time is an idea. Now, plural words refer to more than one person, place, thing, or idea. Here are some examples of plural words. Women, villages, kayaks, times. In each of these cases, we've taken the singular word that we gave you a moment ago and turned it into plural. Now it refers to two or more women, villages, kayaks, or times. Now in English, plural nouns are usually formed by adding the letter S or ES to the singular form. So, for example, the word car, which is singular, becomes plural simply by adding the letter S at the end, cars. The word box becomes plural by adding ES at the end, boxes. Perhaps you can see that simply adding the letter S at the end would create a word that's rather awkward looking and difficult to pronounce. And that's why words that end in X are generally made plural by adding ES rather than simply S. In other cases, the spelling of the word varies slightly in order to turn the singular into the plural. Take a look at this word. The singular is story. The plural is stories. Once again, ES has been added at the end of the word, but notice that the letter Y has been changed to an I, so that the spelling of stories is S-T-O-R-I-E-S, -E a small but important change that's necessary to know if you're going to use this word correctly. Most English plural words end in S or ES, but a few form their plurals in unusual or special ways. And it's important to recognize these rules as well. These have to do with proper spelling. Here are some examples of these exceptional words. Men, women, and children are three words that are frequently used in English and all form their plurals in unusual ways. The singular of men is man. So you see that the vowel A has been changed into an E to turn the word from singular to plural. Similarly, the singular of women is woman, spelled with an A. And again, the vowel has been changed to E to turn singular into plural. The singular of children is child. So here the letters R-E-N have been added at the end. What's the rule or principle that underlies these changes? Well, there really is none. You simply have to remember and apply these rules when you use these words. Take a word like leaf. When we turn this into a plural, not only do we add ES at the end, but we also change the spelling. The F that ends the word leaf turns into a V, and the plural form of leaf is leaves. Many, though not all words that end in F, 
are turned into plurals in just this way, by changing the F into a V and then adding ES. And then there are a few words referring to different kinds of animals, which are exactly the same in the singular and the plural. For example, sheep is the singular referring to one kind of animal, and if you had a whole flock of them, you would refer to a flock of sheep. Yes, the word sheep is exactly the same in the singular and the plural. Here's a tip. When you're writing an English sentence and you have to use a plural word and you're not certain how to form the plural, look it up in your dictionary. You'll find that for any word where the plural is formed in an unusual way, you'll be told exactly how to form it. But again, the vast majority of words in English are turned from singular to plural simply by adding s or es at the end. Now, all the words we've looked at so far are nouns, words that name people, places, things, or ideas. Verbs can also be singular or plural. In many cases, the singular and plural form of the verb are exactly the same. But in a few cases, the singular and plural are different. Once again, you need to learn how these are formed and practice using them correctly. In most cases, it's very easy to recognize and use the singular and plural. One thing about English that may be a little bit confusing is that the singular forms of verbs often end in s or es. This can be confusing because, as we saw a moment ago in the case of nouns, s or es at the end is usually the sign that a plural is involved. With verbs, it's just the opposite. The singular form of verbs often end in s or es. So, for example, look at these phrases. She jumps, they jump. He does, they do. Notice that in each case, the singular form of the verb ends in s or es, while the plural form of the verb does not. Once again, it's simply a rule you need to learn and understand and apply to English. There's no rhyme or reason behind it. That's just the way it's done in the English language. Now, the basic principle for using singular and plural nouns and verbs properly is quite a simple one. It goes like this. A singular subject must have a singular verb. A plural subject must have a plural verb. Well, this may seem obvious enough. The problem is that in some specific kinds of sentences, applying this rule can get a bit tricky. Let's look at some of these tricky situations next. One of the situations in which subject-verb agreement may be a little tricky is when the subject of the verb is an indefinite pronoun. Now, in this series, we have an entire program devoted to pronouns and how to use them. You'll probably want to view that program in order to improve your background knowledge of pronouns and how to use them. But for our purposes today, you simply need to know that an indefinite pronoun is a word that's used in place of a noun and whose reference is indefinite or uncertain. Indefinite pronouns are words like someone, anyone, all, none, some, most, and so on. You can see from this list that Indefinite pronouns refer to people or things in a way that's a little bit unclear. You can't know for sure who or what is being referred to by an indefinite pronoun unless you look at the entire context of the sentence or paragraph in which the indefinite pronoun is used. And that's why indefinite pronouns can sometimes make for tricky subject-verb agreement problems. In order to use indefinite pronouns correctly, and match them up with the proper singular or plural verb, you need to know a few basic rules. Here's what you need to understand about indefinite pronouns. Basically, indefinite pronouns can be broken down into three categories. Some are always singular, some are always plural, and some may be either singular or plural, depending on the context. The following indefinite pronouns are always singular. Each, either, one, neither, and all pronouns ending in body or one, such as anybody, somebody, nobody, anyone, no one, and someone. Whenever you use one of these indefinite pronouns as the subject of a verb, always consider the pronoun singular and use a singular verb as well. Now, the following indefinite pronouns are always plural, both, few, 
many, others, several. Perhaps you can see from this list that these indefinite pronouns always refer to more than one person, place, thing, or idea. That's why they're considered plural grammatically and need to be matched up with a plural verb. Now here comes the tricky bit. There are five pronouns which may be either singular or plural, depending on how they're used. We call these the SANAM pronouns, simply because those letters, S-A-N-A-M, are an acronym that reminds us of the five pronouns that are involved, because each of those letters is the first letter of one of the indefinite pronouns that fits into this category. The five SANAM pronouns are some, any, none, all, and most. These five pronouns, the SANAM pronouns, may be either singular or plural, depending on how they're used. Take a look at these two sentences. Some of the pie was eaten. Some of the students were late. Now, in both of these sentences, an indefinite pronoun is the subject of the verb. Look at the first sentence. Some of the pie was eaten. The verb here is was eaten. That's a verb phrase that begins with the helping verb was. What's the subject of the verb? Some. Some was eaten. Some of what? Some of the pie. But the pronoun some is the specific word which is the simple subject of the verb. Now is that uh, pronoun singular or plural? In this case, it's referring to some of the pie, which is a single thing, one piece of the pie. Therefore, we consider the pronoun singular in this sentence, and that's why the singular verb was eaten is correct. However, look at this sentence. Some of the students were late. Here the verb is were, and that's a plural verb. Why is a plural verb used? Once again, the subject is the indefinite pronoun some. But in this sentence, some refers to more than one person. Some of the students means two, three, four, a group of students. And therefore, it refers to a plural subject, and that's why the plural verb were is correct. So we have the same word, the same indefinite pronoun, as the subject in each of these two sentences. But in one case, the subject is singular. In the other, it's plural. That's the way it is with the SANAM pronouns. Here's a tip that will help you tell whether the SANAM pronoun is singular or plural in a particular sentence. The SANAM pronoun is usually followed by a prepositional phrase. In both of these sentences, the prepositional phrase begins with the preposition of, of the pie, of the students. If you look at the prepositional phrase and look at the object of the prepositional phrase, that will provide a clue as to whether the SANAM pronoun is singular or plural. If the object of the prepositional phrase is singular, then the SANAM pronoun is singular. If the object of the prepositional phrase is plural, then the SANAM uh, pronoun is also plural. That's why some of the pi is singular, because pi is singular, whereas some of the students is plural, because students is plural. So look at the prepositional phrase that follows the SANAM pronoun, and that will give you a clue as to whether the SANAM pronoun is singular or plural. Here's another tricky situation for subject-verb agreement. In some sentences, the subject of the verb is a collective noun. Now, what is a collective noun? A collective noun is a noun that's singular in form, that is, it usually doesn't end in S or ES, but which refers to a group of people, places, things, or ideas. Some examples of collective nouns are team, group, class, flock, committee, family. I think you can see that in each of these cases, the word refers to a number of people who are all gathered together under a single word. And that's why we call these collective nouns. Here's the rule. When the subject of the verb is a collective noun, use either a singular verb or a plural verb, depending on how the noun is used. When the noun refers to the group as a whole, use a singular verb. When the noun refers to the group as individuals, use a plural verb. Here are a couple of examples that should clarify this distinction. Look at this sentence. The team is ready for the game. The verb here is is, and the subject of the verb is team, 
and team is a collective noun. It refers to a group of people who all play a particular sport. Now in this sentence we're told the team is ready for the game. That means the team as a whole is ready. All of them together are set as one unit. They're prepared and ready to play. Therefore, in this particular case, the collective noun refers to the group as a whole, and therefore a singular verb is, is appropriate. Contrast that with this sentence. The team are dressing in the locker room. Once again, the collective noun team is the subject of the verb. In this case, the verb is are dressing, and here a plural verb has been used. Why? Well, think about what the team is doing. When the team are getting dressed, it's a group of individuals who are all getting dressed. One person is probably putting on his shoes, another person may be tying his tie, a third person may be combing his hair. They're all doing different things at the same time, all of which adds up to the collective group dressing together. But it's a number of individuals doing separate things that go to make up the act of dressing in the locker room. So in this case, the collective noun is being used to refer to a group of people who are doing things separately. And that's why treating the collective noun as plural and using a plural verb is appropriate in this sentence. I'll point out that in the majority of cases, collective nouns are singular and are used as such. So when in doubt, go with a singular verb. Because in most cases, when a collective noun is used, the group is being referred to as a whole. And it is the exception when the collective noun is being used to refer to the group as a collection of individuals, as in this case. But that's the rule, and now you know why collective nouns will sometimes be used with a singular verb, sometimes with a plural verb. If you practice this distinction, you shouldn't have too much difficulty using collective nouns. Here's another tricky situation for subject-verb agreement. A subject that describes an amount is singular. Sometimes the subject of a verb appears to be plural, and yet when you think about it, it's describing an amount which is really one thing. Here's an example. One million dollars is a lot of money. In this case, the verb is is, which is singular. What's the subject of the verb? Well, the subject is the phrase one million dollars. Now, that certainly looks plural. Dollars has an S at the end, and it does refer to lots of dollars, more than one dollar, one million of them in this case. So one million dollars certainly seems as though it ought to be plural. But let's think about what the sentence is saying. The sentence is talking about one million dollars as an amount. And it's talking about it as one thing. It's saying that this whole pile of money all added together is a lot of money. That's why a singular verb is appropriate in this case, because although it's plural in form, the phrase describes an amount, and therefore we treat it as singular. Here's another example. Five minutes in the dentist's chair feels like a long time. Here the verb is feels. Again, it's singular. What's the subject? Five minutes or minutes. Once again, it's grammatically plural. It ends in S, and it does refer to more than one thing, five minutes. But if we step back and think about how the phrase is being used, it really refers to the five minutes as a single unit, one stretch of time, which may be very unpleasant when you're sitting in the dentist's chair, and that's why it feels like a long time. So that one stretch of time, that one amount, is treated as singular, and that's why a singular verb is appropriate. Finally, one more tip for another type of tricky situation. The phrase, the number, is singular. The phrase, a number, is plural. These two phrases might seem equivalent, and yet they're treated differently for grammatical purposes. Here's what we mean. The number of children in the family is three. In this case, we're using the phrase, the number. And this is really an example of the situation we talked about a moment before. The subject in this case is describing an amount, the amount of children or the number of children in the family. So we really consider it singular. The number is three. Look at this example. A number of children are waiting for their parents. Now in this case, we're using the phrase a number, which may look very similar to the number. But in this context, what the phrase a number of children is referring to is several children. 
more than one child, three, four, five children. That's what we mean when we say a number of children. So in this case, the subject of the verb is really plural, and that's why the plural verb, are waiting, has been used. The basic rule that's easy to remember is the number is singular, a number is plural. Subject-verb agreement is usually a simple matter in most sentences. Singular subject, singular verb. Plural subject, plural verb. But in tricky situations like the ones we've just seen, it can be a little difficult to tell what type of verb is appropriate to use. The rules we've just covered should help. Turn to your study guide. We've provided an exercise that will give you a chance to practice these rules and test your ability to choose the right verb for certain tricky situations in English. Try your hand at the questions, and when you're finished, come back to this program, and we'll look at them together. In each of these sentences, a verb was omitted, and your job is to decide which of the two verbs you're given to choose from is correct in the context. In each case, the two verbs that are provided are first singular, then plural. So if you could figure out whether the subject was singular or plural, it would be pretty easy to choose the correct verb. Let's see how well you did. The first example reads, 400 pages seems, or seem, like an awfully long reading assignment for the holiday weekend. Here the two verbs are singular seems, plural seem. What's the subject, and is it singular or plural? Well, the subject is the amount, 400 pages. It looks plural, and it certainly is plural in form, since pages ends in S, and it does refer to more than one page, in fact, 400 pages. But remember our rule that a subject that describes an amount is normally singular. In this case, the entire amount, 400 pages, that long book, is being treated and considered as a single thing. That whole amount is a long reading assignment. And that's why the singular verb seems would actually be correct. Remember that when the subject is plural in form, but it describes an amount which is treated as one thing, you want a singular verb. And that's why seems would be correct in this sentence. Our next example. Neither of the injured dancers is or are feeling well enough to perform this evening. Here we have a choice between the singular verb is and the plural verb are, which is correct. Well, the subject is neither, and you might recall that neither is one of the pronouns that's an indefinite pronoun which is always singular. That's one of the pronouns on that list which would always be singular. And in fact, if you think about how the pronoun is being used, you can see that it refers to one person. When we say neither of the dancers, we mean each one of them, one at a time. We're considering that each of them individually um, is not feeling well enough to perform this evening. Since we're talking about each of the dancers one at a time, it should be considered singular. And the pronoun neither is singular grammatically, and that's why the uh, singular verb is would be correct in this sentence. Our next example. The orchestra has or have recently completed a successful tour of several Asian countries. Now, in this sentence, the subject is the collective noun, orchestra. The word orchestra is singular in form, but it refers to a large number of people, 80, 90, 100 people go together to make up an orchestra. So it's a collective noun. And remember, a collective noun may be either singular or plural, depending on how it's used. Most often, a collective noun is singular, and that is when the collective noun is being used to refer to the group as a whole, doing one action together. In some exceptional circumstances, the collective noun may be plural. If the sentence is describing actions taken by each of the individual members of the collective noun, how is this collective noun being used? Well, we're told that the orchestra completed a successful tour of several Asian countries. Does that describe an action taken separately by all of the individual members of the orchestra? The oboists, the drummers, the fiddle players, the uh, uh, horn players? No, it's describing something that the entire orchestra did together as a unit. Therefore, the collective noun is being used to refer to the group as a unit 
and should be considered singular. So we want the singular verb has rather than the plural verb have. The sentence should read, the orchestra has recently completed a successful tour of several Asian countries. The next sentence. All of the stonemasons working on the cathedral is or are residents of Harlem. Once again, we have to decide whether the subject is singular or plural. Now, what is the subject of the verb? Is it cathedral, stonemasons, or all? It's actually the pronoun all. The sentence is not saying something that the cathedral is or are, nor is it saying something that the stonemasons is or are. It's saying something that all is or are. And in the next lesson in this program, we'll explain exactly why the pronoun all should be zeroed in on as the subject of the verb. It's a little bit tricky in its own right. But the indefinite pronoun all is the subject of this verb. Now, is all singular or plural? Remember that all is one of the five indefinite pronouns that we call the sanam pronouns. Some, all, none, any, and most. Those five pronouns may be either singular or plural, depending on how they're used. Now, in this case, is the pronoun all referring to one or more than one person? Remember our tip. Look at the prepositional phrase that follows the sanam pronoun, and that will give you a clue as to whether one or more than one subject is being referred to. Here, the prepositional phrase that follows the pronoun all is of the stonemasons. And the object of that preposition, of, is masons, which is plural. So taken together, the entire phrase, all of the stonemasons, is referring to more than one person. It's a group of stonemasons. So in this case, the sanam pronoun all is being used as a plural pronoun. And so a plural verb is necessary. The sentence ought to read, all of the stonemasons working on the cathedral are residents of Harlem, plural. And our last example, everyone in the class was or were surprised at how easy the final exam was. Once again, an indefinite pronoun is being used as the subject of the verb. In this case, the indefinite pronoun is everyone. Now remember what we said. All indefinite pronouns that end in either body or one are always singular. So uh, everyone, someone, no one, all three of those indefinite pronouns would always be treated as singular grammatically. So we need a singular verb in this sentence, and it ought to read, everyone in the class was surprised at how easy the final exam was. Were you surprised at how easy these questions were? I hope so. Let's move on to our next lesson. As we've seen, the basic principle of subject-verb agreement isn't very difficult. A singular subject needs a singular verb, and a plural subject needs a plural verb. In the last lesson, we looked at certain types of words which make it a little tricky to determine whether the subject is singular or plural. Specifically, we looked at indefinite pronouns and collective nouns. Now, there are other kinds of sentences in which determining subject-verb agreement can be a little bit tricky. And in this lesson, we're going to look at some of these other types of tricky sentence structures, which make subject-verb agreement a little bit difficult. One tricky type of sentence for subject-verb agreement involves a compound subject. Now, as you may recall, a compound subject consists of two or more parts which are joined by a conjunction, usually and or or. And taken together, these parts make up the subject of the verb. Now, when the subject is compound, if the parts of the compound subject are joined by and, you usually use a plural verb. Here's an example. Omar and Sarah are going bowling. Here, the verb is are going, and the subject is the compound subject, Omar and Sarah. We have two parts joined by the conjunction and, and this is a very typical kind of compound subject. Notice that although each of the parts of the compound subject is singular, Omar, Sarah, each of these is a singular word, taken together, they make up a compound subject which is treated as plural. After all, Omar and Sarah are two people, and therefore the subject of this verb now refers to more than one person, it's plural, and a plural verb, 
are going is required. So this is the most typical kind of compound subject where we have two or more parts joined by the conjunction and, and normally this would be treated as a plural subject. However, there are two exceptions. First, if the two parts together make up one thing, use a singular verb rather than a plural verb. Here's an example. The skull and crossbones was a famous pirate symbol. Now, in this sentence, we have a compound subject, skull and crossbones, two things joined by the conjunction and. So your immediate inclination would probably be to say, well, this is a plural subject, and so we need a plural verb. And that means that the verb was is wrong. That's singular, and we should use the plural were instead. Here's the problem. In this case, the compound subject doesn't really refer to two or more things. Instead, the skull and crossbones is one symbol. Perhaps you've seen pictures of pirate ships from the old days flying a black flag with the symbol of a skull and crossbones. Taken together, that symbol, the skull and crossbones, makes up one image, which is being described in this sentence as a famous pirate symbol. Since the two things that are mentioned here really go together to form one image or one symbol, we treat it as singular grammatically. And that's why the singular verb was is actually correct in this sentence. The skull and crossbones was a famous pirate symbol. This exception to the rule doesn't come up very often, but when it does, you should be aware of it and be looking for a singular verb rather than a plural verb. Here's the second exception. If the two parts of the compound subject are preceded by each or every, use a singular verb. When we use the words each or every in front of the parts of a compound subject, we are really changing the subject so that we're talking about each element of the subject separately and individually. And that's why we're turning the subject from plural into singular. Look at this example. Each pot and pan was washed and carefully put away. Notice that in this sentence we've got the singular verb was, was washed and was put away, rather than the plural verb were. Why is that? Well, here we do have a compound subject, pot and pan, joined by the conjunction and, which would normally lead us to expect a plural verb. But it's preceded by the word each. And therefore, the subject is changed from plural to singular. We're now talking about each individual pot and pan, one at, a, at a time. And therefore, we use the singular verb was rather than plural. Once again, this exception doesn't come up too often. 90% of the time, when you have a compound subject that consists of two or more parts joined by the conjunction and, you want a plural verb. But in this particular case, you want a singular verb instead. Now, when the subject is compound, if the parts of the compound subject are joined by the conjunction or, we have a different rule. In this case, the verb should match the subject that is closest to the verb. This is a slightly strange and surprising rule, but let's look at a couple of examples and you'll see how it works. Either Andre or his parents have left an umbrella in the closet. Now, here we have a compound subject which consists of two parts, Andre, his parents. Now, notice that one of the parts is singular, Andre, the other is plural, his parents, and they're joined by the conjunction or. That means the rule kicks in that the verb should agree with whichever subject is closer to the verb. We have two subjects, one singular, one plural. Which one is closer to the verb have left? Well, his parents is closer to the verb than Andre. Since the plural subject is closer to the verb, it comes second in the compound subject, the verb should also be plural. So have left is correct. What does this mean? It means that if you were to reverse the order of the parts in the compound subject in this particular sentence, the verb would have to change. So if the sentence were changed to read like this, either Andre's parents or Andre, then the verb would have to be has left. Singular would now be correct because Andre, the singular subject, is now closer to the verb than the plural subject. 
So it does make a difference what order the subjects are given in this particular type of situation. So when the compound subject consists of two or more parts separated by or, decide on subject-verb agreement by looking at the subject that's closer to the verb. One more example. The students or their teacher is expected to close the classroom door. Same kind of situation. Here we have two subjects separated by or. Students, their teacher. The first one, students, is plural. Their teacher is singular. Which one should the verb match? Well, since their teacher is closer to the verb, is expected is correct. That's a singular verb, and it matches up with their teacher, which is also singular. We've been talking about compound subjects quite a bit. Here's another somewhat tricky or misleading situation that many students get wrong. Words like as well as and in addition to do not create a compound subject. Now, you might think that words or phrases like as well as and in addition to should be grammatically the same as the word and. After all, they mean much the same thing. But grammatically, they are treated differently. The conjunction and creates a compound subject when it's used to join two words or phrases describing subjects of the verb. However, when the phrase as well as or the phrase in addition to is used in place of the conjunction and, the effect is different. Take a look at this sentence. The principal, as well as her husband, was a special guest at the awards banquet. The verb is was. What's the subject? Well, the subject is principal. Notice that her husband is not part of the subject in this case. We don't have a compound subject because rather than the conjunction and, the phrase as well as has been used. You might also notice that in this particular sentence, the words as well as her husband have been set off by commas. That indicates correctly that that entire phrase, as well as her husband, is a bit of an interrupter. It comes in between the subject and the verb and doesn't become part of the subject. Therefore, the subject is the singular principle and the singular verb, was, is correct. If we were to take away the words, as well as, and substitute the conjunction, and, notice what would happen. We'd get rid of the commas, and the sentence would now read, the principal and her husband were special guests at the awards banquet. Now we would have a compound subject joined by the conjunction and, principal and her husband, and the two together would make up the subject, which would become plural, and the verb would have to become the plural, were. But as long as the phrase, as well as, is used, we don't have a compound subject, we have a singular subject only, and a singular verb is required. When words separate the subject and the verb, finding the subject may be tricky. We've already seen several sentences where this was the case, where isolating and identifying the subject of the verb is not so easy, because a number of words come in between the subject and the verb. Here's a tip that helps with 90% of these sentences. Eliminate prepositional phrases before trying to identify the subject. As a general rule, a prepositional phrase never contains the subject of the verb. And therefore, when you are looking for the subject of a sentence in order to make sure that you've got subject-verb agreement correct, you can mentally eliminate all the prepositional phrases, all the phrases that begin with those little prepositions, words like of, in, by, for, from, to, with, and so on. Eliminate those prepositions and the words that follow them, and what remains must contain the subject. That's an easy way of eliminating all the words that might distract you from isolating the real subject and therefore confuse you as to how subject-verb agreement should work. If you can eliminate the prepositional phrases, that will help you a lot in zeroing in on the correct subject of the verb. Take a look at this example. The distance between the Earth and the more distant stars of our galaxy is difficult to measure. In this case, the verb is easy to find, as it usually is in most sentences. The verb is, is. Now, that's a singular verb. Is the sentence correct or incorrect? Well, we have to identify the subject in order to determine whether a singular verb is correct or incorrect. Now, what is the subject? What is it that's difficult to measure? Is it the distance 
Is it the earth? Is it the stars? Is it the galaxy? All of those are nouns, and any one of them could be the subject of the verb. But which one really is the subject of the verb? Well, in order to figure out what's difficult to measure, we need to eliminate prepositional phrases. That will help us zero in on what the real subject of the verb is. And there are a few prepositional phrases here. Between the Earth and the more distant stars is one prepositional phrase, and of our galaxy is another prepositional phrase. Between and of are both prepositions, and the words that follow those prepositions and are linked to them are the objects of the prepositions. By eliminating those phrases, we can see that what's left is the distance. And in fact, that makes sense. After all, that's what is difficult to measure. The distance is what is difficult to measure. So the sentence is saying that the distance is difficult to measure. Distance is a singular word. And so the singular verb is is correct. You might have been confused because the noun stars, for example, is plural. And that might lead you to momentarily think well, perhaps we need a plural verb in this sentence. It's not true. Eliminate the words that come between the subject and the verb, particularly the prepositional phrases, and what remains is the real subject, and that will tell you how subject-verb agreement ought to be handled. In addition, when the subject follows the verb, finding the subject may be tricky. As you've already seen, in the great majority of English sentences, the subject comes before the verb. But occasionally, that's not true. And in that case, you need to look after the verb to find the subject and make sure that it agrees with the verb. Here's a tip. In a question or in a sentence beginning with there or here, the subject usually follows the verb. So when you're dealing with a sentence which poses a question or which begins with there or here, look after the verb to find the true subject. Here are a couple of examples. Are the computers ready for installation? Here the verb is the very first word in the sentence, are. And that's often the case with questions. There's a question mark at the end of this sentence, which is certainly a telltale sign that we're dealing with a question here. Since the verb comes first, obviously the subject must come later. Now, what's the subject of the verb are? Well, the subject is the noun computers. Uh, notice that if we were to turn this sentence away from being a question into being a statement, it would read something like, the computers are ready for installation. And then it would be obvious that computers is the subject of the verb are. Since computers is plural, the verb are, which is also plural, is perfectly correct. Because this is a question, we need to look after the verb to find the subject. One more example. There is a good reason for my lateness this morning. In English, many times we speak sentences or write sentences that begin with there is, there are, here is, here are. You might at first glance think that there or here is the subject, but neither of those is a noun, and so therefore they can't really be the subject of the verb. Remember our tip. In sentences that begin with there or here, the verb normally precedes the subject. The subject comes after the verb. In this case, the verb is is, and what follows, reason, is actually uh, the subject. Reason is singular, and so the singular verb is is correct. Uh, once again, when a sentence begins with there or here, the subject normally follows the verb, so look after the verb to find the subject and make sure it matches with the verb in terms of number, singular or plural. Do you think you've mastered these tricky situations and how to apply subject-verb agreement appropriately in each of these types of sentences? Well, let's test that. We've provided an exercise in your study guide that will test the skills we've just discussed. Try your hand at those questions, and when you're finished, come back to the program, and we'll see how well you did. Once again, in this exercise, your job is to select the correct verb to match up properly with the subject. And in some of these sentences, that's a rather tricky matter. Let's see how well you did. First, the governor, having met with her advisors and developed a negotiating strategy for dealing with the angry workers, was or were finally ready to join the bargaining session. Here we have to decide whether to use the singular was or the plural were. 
And the question is, what's the subject of the verb? Who or what was or were finally ready to join the bargaining session? Well, the subject and the verb in this sentence are separated by a lot of words. One clue in this case is that there's a comma representing a pause surrounding a lengthy phrase here in the middle of the sentence. I'm referring to the words, having met with her advisors and developed a negotiating strategy for dealing with the angry workers. All of those words are giving more information about or modifying the governor. So all of that is a bit of an interruption, an aside. It's something that gives additional information about the governor, but which is not part of the actual subject. The person who was or were finally ready to join the bargaining session was or is the governor. So the word governor is the subject of the verb. Governor is singular. It only refers to one person. And so the singular verb was would be correct. Notice how in order to identify the proper subject in this sentence, you have to ignore all the words that come between the subject and the verb. And don't be distracted by them. You might see, for example, the word workers, which is plural, and think, hmm, well, maybe workers, plural verb requires, uh, plural noun requires a plural verb. Uh, but that's not the case, because the workers, that's not the subject of the verb. The workers uh, were not finally ready to join the bargaining session. It's the governor who was finally ready. Singular subject, singular verb. Next example. Here in the deepest recesses of the ocean is or are some of the most mysterious creatures on Earth. Remember our rule that a sentence beginning with there or here usually has the subject following the verb. And that's the case here as well. The verb is is or are, and what follows is what is or are in the deepest recesses of the ocean. What's the subject? The subject is some of the most mysterious creatures on Earth. It's that indefinite pronoun, some, which is the true subject of the verb is or are. Now, is some singular or plural? Now, we kick in with one of our rules from earlier in this program. Remember that some is one of the five sanam pronouns. Some, all, none, any, and most. Each of these five indefinite pronouns may be either singular or plural, depending on how the pronoun is used in the sentence. And as a clue, we said, check out the prepositional phrase that follows. That will usually tell you whether the sanam pronoun is singular or plural. In this case, the sanam pronoun some is followed by the prepositional phrase of the most mysterious creatures on Earth. Since the pronoun is referring to some of the most mysterious creatures, plural, the pronoun is being used as plural in this case as well. Some, therefore, is plural, and the proper verb to go with that subject would also be plural. So the verb should be are, and the sentence would read, here in the deepest recesses of the ocean are some of the most mysterious creatures on Earth. In effect, this sentence tested two of your rules. First, that in a sentence beginning with here or there, the subject usually follows the verb. And second, with a sanam pronoun, you usually need to look at the prepositional phrase that follows the pronoun to determine whether it's singular or plural. Next example. Either the members of the defensive squad or Coach Mayo himself is or are sure to have some explanation for the way the game ended. Now, what's the subject of the verb is or are? In this case, we have a compound subject, two items, two parts, connected by the conjunction or. Here's where our rule kicks in. Remember that when the parts of a compound subject are joined by the conjunction or, the verb should match the subject that's closer to the verb. Now, in this case, we have two parts, the members of the defensive squad, which is plural, and Coach Mayo, which is singular. That refers to just one person. Which of these two parts is closer to the verb? The answer is Coach Mayo, which is singular. So we want a singular verb. The sentence ought to read, either the members of the defensive squad or Coach Mayo himself is sure to have some explanation for the way the game ended. If the two parts of the subject were to be reversed in order, if Coach Mayo came first and the members of the defensive squad came second, then the verb ought to be plural. But that's not the way the sentence is written, and therefore the singular verb is what we want. 
Next example. The story of the 400 members of the 29th Cavalry and their heroic exploits on several battlefields is or are truly remarkable. Once again, we have a sentence in which there are a lot of words that separate the verb from the real subject. Remember one of our tips. When you're in doubt as to where the subject of a sentence really is, eliminate all the prepositional phrases because the subject of the verb will not be found in the prepositional phrase. This sentence has quite a few prepositional phrases. Look at them with me. Of the 400 members, that's a prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition of. Of the 29th Cavalry and their heroic exploits, again a prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition of. On several battlefields, another prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition on. None of these phrases contains the subject of the verb. The real subject of the verb is in what remains the story. What is truly remarkable? It's the story that's truly remarkable. That's singular, and so the singular verb is, is correct. It would be easy to get subject-verb agreement wrong in this sentence because there are so many plural nouns here. Members, exploits, battlefields. You have all those plural nouns ringing in your ears when you come to the verb is or are, and it's easy to select are, thinking, well, I've got a plural subject here. But remember, eliminate the prepositional phrases because they don't contain the subject. The real subject is story. It's the story that's remarkable, and therefore the singular verb is is correct. Our last example. The elementary school cafeteria offers 12 kinds of sandwiches, yet peanut butter and jelly remains or remain the most popular of all. Here we have a compound subject, peanut butter and jelly, and the two parts of the compound subject are joined by the conjunction and. In almost every case, the compound subject where the parts are joined by the conjunction and would be treated as plural. So the plural verb remain would normally be correct. But here we have one of our exceptions. Remember that in a few instances, the two parts of a compound subject joined by and really go together to form a single thing. We saw the example of the skull and crossbones, which formed a single symbol. In this case, we have another example of a compound subject, which really amounts to a single thing. Peanut butter and jelly is one kind of sandwich, one recipe, if you will. It's a single dish rather than two separate things. So uh, what's being described here is really one sandwich, and therefore the compound subject peanut butter and jelly should really be treated as singular because peanut butter and jelly is actually one thing for the purposes of this sentence. So in this somewhat tricky example, the singular verb remains would be correct and the sentence should read, the elementary school cafeteria offers 12 kinds of sandwiches, yet peanut butter and jelly remains the most popular of all. Did you get all five of these sentences correct? If so, you've really mastered these tricky rules about subject-verb agreement. Good job. So far, we've been talking about agreement between subjects and verbs. In this lesson, we're going to talk about agreement between pronouns and antecedents. As you know, a pronoun is a word that takes the place of a noun. And the noun to which the pronoun refers, or whose place the pronoun takes, is called its antecedent. The antecedent may or may not appear in the same sentence or paragraph. Sometimes you have to do a little thinking to figure out what the antecedent of the pronoun is. Nonetheless, it's important that the pronoun and its antecedent match in a couple of ways. The basic rules are these. First, a pronoun must agree with its antecedent in number. That is, a singular antecedent requires a singular pronoun. A plural antecedent requires a plural pronoun. Second, a pronoun must agree with its antecedent in gender. By gender, we mean masculine, feminine, or neuter. Now, in the English language, gender is natural. In other words, masculine, feminine, and neuter are used grammatically in English simply the way the same qualities exist in the natural world. Thus, human beings all have gender. They're either masculine or feminine. And inanimate objects are normally neuter. 
Sometimes animals are treated as having gender. A cow would normally be a she because a cow is feminine, whereas a bull would be considered a he uh, because a bull is masculine. In other cases, however, animals could be treated as neuter. You could probably get away with calling a cow and a bull it. Um, both could be treated with the neuter pronoun it. And it's very rare that inanimate objects other than human beings or animals are assigned a gender in English. They're almost always treated as neuter. Once in a while, an inanimate object may be treated as masculine or feminine. For example, sometimes someone might speak about their boat as being she. But that's rather rare and unusual. So for all practical purposes in the English language, gender is natural and not purely grammatical. Of course, this is different from some other languages that you may know, where it's necessary to memorize the gender of long lists of nouns, the sun, the moon, the stars. All of these are assigned masculine or feminine attributes grammatically. That's not the case in English. All of those inanimate objects would simply be referred to as it using the neuter pronoun. However, when you're dealing with human beings, and in some cases with animals, you do need to be aware of gender and use masculine or feminine appropriately. The pronouns he, him, and his are masculine. The pronouns she, her, and hers are feminine. The neuter pronouns are it and its, and these are used for antecedents that are neither masculine nor feminine. Notice that the plural pronouns they, them, and their can be used for antecedents of any gender, masculine, feminine, or neuter. So once you move from singular to plural, everything becomes very simple. You don't have to worry about gender anymore. Again, these basic rules are quite simple, and in most sentences you won't run into any difficulty in following them and making sure that the pronouns and antecedents match both in number and in gender. But there are a few tricky situations that arise, and we'll cover those now. First, use a singular pronoun to refer to a singular indefinite pronoun. Use a plural pronoun to refer to a plural indefinite pronoun. Now, we've seen earlier in this program that indefinite pronouns can be tricky to use in terms of their singular and plural qualities. Indefinite pronouns may sometimes seem to refer to plural qualities, that is, to groups of people, and yet be treated as grammatically singular. All the same rules that we discussed earlier in this program about which indefinite pronouns are singular and which ones are plural would apply when matching them up with pronouns that refer back to these pronouns. So follow the same rules in terms of singular and plural, and any pronouns that refer back to indefinite pronouns should be used correctly in your sentences. Here's an example. Each of the men was waiting for his wife. Now, here we have the pronoun his referring back to the antecedent each. Each of the men was waiting for his wife. Whose wife? Each of their wives. So each is the antecedent of the pronoun his. So we have a pronoun acting as an antecedent for another pronoun, which can sometimes happen. Now remember, the antecedent and the pronoun must match in number. So in order to determine whether the pronoun his is correct, we need to look back at that antecedent and decide whether it's singular or plural. Is the antecedent each singular or plural? Well, remember that the indefinite pronoun each is one of the ones on the list that are always singular. Each is always singular, and therefore to refer back to it with a singular pronoun is perfectly correct. Notice, too, that the verb was waiting is also singular, and that's also correct. So the entire sentence is singular. Each is a singular indefinite pronoun. The singular verb was waiting is correct. And the singular pronoun his, referring back to each, is also correct. Here's a different example. Many of the women were waiting for their husbands. Now here we have the uh, pronoun there, which refers back to the antecedent many. Many were waiting for their husbands. Now what about that pronoun many? Is it singular or plural? Again, it's an indefinite pronoun, so the answer isn't necessarily obvious. 
Once again, many is one of our sanam pronouns, those five pronouns which may be either singular or plural, depending on how they're used. And our tip is always to look at the prepositional phrase that follows the sanam pronoun to help you determine whether it's singular or plural. In this case, many is followed by the prepositional phrase of the women. And the object of that prepositional phrase is plural, women. Therefore, the sanam pronoun many is also plural. And there, the pronoun that refers back to many is also correct. Many is plural. The verb we're waiting is plural. And there is also plural. All these three match together. And therefore, the sentence is perfectly correct. So when you're using a pronoun that refers back to an indefinite pronoun, use the rules we've already talked about to determine whether that indefinite pronoun is singular or plural, and choose the next pronoun appropriately to match. Now, when the antecedent of a singular pronoun may be either male or female, you need to use he or she, him or her, or his or hers. Remember, we saw that with singular pronouns, gender is an issue, masculine and feminine. With plural pronouns, it's not an issue, because in English, there are no masculine and feminine genders for plural pronouns. So when you're setting up a singular pronoun, you need to know whether the antecedent is male or female. In most cases, this isn't difficult. You're either talking about a man or a woman. But sometimes the antecedent may be of uncertain gender. And I don't just mean someone who looks strange walking down the street. What I'm talking about is a sentence like this one. Everyone should bring his or her notebook to class. Now here we have the phrase his or her. Both masculine and feminine pronouns are being used here. And that's correct for a specific reason. What is the antecedent of his or her? What does his or her refer to? Well, it refers back to the indefinite pronoun everyone. And when you think about what's being said in this sentence, we can't really tell whether everyone refers to a male or a female. Now, this might be uh, false in a specific circumstance. For instance, suppose this happened to be a class made up of nothing but men. Perhaps it's a class on how to be a better father, in which case we would know that everyone in the class is a male, and we could assume then that everyone refers only to males. And we would write the sentence differently. We could say, everyone should bring his notebook to class. On the other hand, it could be a class made up only of women. It could be a class in auto repair for women. If everyone in the class were female, then the sentence could correctly read, everyone should bring her notebook to class. However, most classes nowadays include both men and women. And so the indefinite pronoun everyone needs to be considered in this case as possibly either masculine or feminine. Under these circumstances, the correct way to set up the sentence is by using the phrase his or her. And that's what we've done in this sentence. Everyone should bring his or her notebook to class. That way, no matter whether the individual student is male or female, the correct pronoun would have been used. Now, this sentence is an interesting example of how language reflects social changes. At one time, the rule for this kind of sentence was different. The rule at one time, a number of years ago, was that in English, you would use the masculine pronoun in a sentence like this. The idea seemed to be that girls were invisible. Women could be ignored, or they would simply be considered as included within the masculine pronoun. And there are still a few very old-fashioned writers who still follow that rule. They would write this sentence, everyone should bring his notebook to class. And they would say, well, if the women don't like it, that's too bad. That's the way I learned grammar when I was a child back before the war. Some of these old-fashioned writers are the same people who complain about having women commentators at football games. The rule that most people follow nowadays is not to use the masculine pronoun, but the rule we've given you to use his and her. That's considered more correct and polite, and it does recognize half of the human race appropriately. There is one problem with this construction. It can feel a little bit awkward. And if the same kind of construction occurs two or three times in a paragraph, it can feel especially awkward. If you find yourself writing a paragraph in which you are saying, his or her, his or her, he and she, 
over and over again, it begins to feel a little bit uncomfortable. You're throwing in so many extra words. Here's a tip for how to get out of that problem. For a more graceful sentence, try rewriting it in plural form. Here's the clever thing about the English language. As we've seen, in English, plural pronouns don't have gender. There's no masculine or feminine. You use they, them, and there, no matter whether you're dealing with male, female, or neuter antecedents. So if you make a sentence like this plural, you get beyond the gender issue altogether. So this sentence, everyone should bring his or her notebook to class, could be rewritten the following way. Students should bring their notebooks to class. Now we've used the plural pronoun there to refer back to the antecedent students, and there is neither masculine nor feminine. It includes males, females, what have you. And so this gets around the question of gender and makes for a shorter, more concise, and a little more graceful sentence. So if you find yourself writing a number of sentences with his or her, he or she, uh, over and over again, and it is beginning to feel awkward, stop and look at the sentence and see whether you couldn't say the same thing using a plural structure instead. That's an easy way to get around the gender issue without offending half of the human race. And it's a clever trick that skilled writers often use. Now that you've learned a few basic tips about how to master pronoun and antecedent agreement, turn to your study guide and try the exercise, which will test those skills. When you're finished, come back to this program, and we'll take a look at those questions together. Let's look at our first sentence. According to the police officer's testimony, someone was seen entering the bank just before the robbery carrying a red pocketbook under her or their arm. All right, we have two pronouns to choose from here. One of them is singular and feminine, her. The other is plural, their. And of course, the plural pronoun doesn't have a gender because that's the way plural pronouns are in English. So we have to decide whether to choose a singular or a plural pronoun. Notice, by the way, that a feminine pronoun, her, has been given rather than a masculine pronoun, his. Why is that? Well, the person is described as carrying a red pocketbook. So I guess the assumption is that this person is a female, because in our society, more females carry red pocketbooks than do men. So this appears to be a female that we're talking about, and that's why the feminine pronoun her has been used. Now, should a singular or a plural pronoun be used? What is the antecedent of the pronoun? That's always the rule in determining what the proper pronoun would be. What does the pronoun refer to? Earlier in this sentence, there is an antecedent. The antecedent is someone. It is someone who is carrying the red pocketbook under her or their arm. Now, someone is an indefinite pronoun, and if you remember our rule, indefinite pronouns ending in one and body are always singular. So someone is singular, and therefore the singular pronoun her is correct rather than their. Notice, by the way, that some writers would incorrectly use the pronoun their in this sentence, a plural pronoun, even though the antecedent is clearly singular, someone. Why do some writers use this? They use it as a way of getting around the gender issue, having to choose a masculine or a feminine pronoun. However, that's not an appropriate way to get around the gender issue by creating a mistake in terms of number. Someone is singular, and therefore you have to use a singular pronoun. As we saw in the lesson, if you're uncertain of the gender that is being referred to, you can use his or her, he or she, him or her. That would be the correct way of dealing with the gender issue. It's not correct to switch over to a plural pronoun unless you recast the entire sentence to make the antecedent plural as well. If the antecedent is singular, you have to choose a singular pronoun in this case, and that's why her is correct. Next example. Both of the skydivers had brought his or their own parachutes and safety gear in preparation for tomorrow's jump. His or their are the two pronouns we have to choose from. Again, one is singular and one is plural, which is correct. 
Well, to answer that, we need to decide what's the antecedent of the pronoun. And the antecedent is the pronoun both. Again, it's an indefinite pronoun, and if you recall your rules, you'll remember that both as a pronoun is always plural in meaning. Therefore, the second pronoun in this sentence should also be plural to match its antecedent. The correct word here is there, and the sentence should read, both of the skydivers had brought their own parachutes and safety gear in preparation for tomorrow's jump. The sentence is plural all the way through. Next example. Anyone who wants to attend next Saturday's dance at the Rotary Club can pick up his or her or their ticket at the information booth on Vincy Street. Once again, we have a singular or plural issue. We've all been offered two choices of pronouns, his or her, which is singular, or their, which is plural, which is correct. You might be tempted to choose their because in a general way, the meaning of the sentence seems to be referring to more than one person. People who want to go to the dance at the Rotary Club would probably be more than one person. We're probably, in a general way, talking about a group of people. So your inclination might be to say, well, this is plural, and so the plural pronoun there is correct. But that's not how grammar works. Rather than going vaguely by the meaning of the sentence, you have to look for the actual antecedent. And the antecedent, that is the word to which the pronoun refers, is anyone. And remember our rule, those indefinite pronouns that end in body and one are always grammatically singular. Even in sentences like this, where they seem to refer to more than one person, grammatically we treat them as singular, and therefore the pronoun referring back to them should also be singular. Therefore we choose the singular pronoun, his or her, in this case. We need to use his or her because the gender of the person picking up the ticket is not known. Could be male, could be female, so his or her is the correct way of handling this situation. Our next example. No one knows whether any of the churches or synagogues in town will provide space in its or their buildings for a homeless shelter. Okay, again we have a choice between singular and plural pronouns, which is correct. To answer that, once again, we have to find the antecedent. Which word earlier in the sentence is being referred to by its or their? Is it churches? Is it synagogues? Well, not exactly. It's really any. No one knows whether any blah, blah, blah will provide space in its or their buildings for a homeless shelter. Once again, we kind of ignore the prepositional phrase in determining what the antecedent is. So its or their, that pronoun refers back to any, the indefinite pronoun. So once again, we have to ask, is any, sing uh, is any uh, singular or plural? And any is one of those five sanam pronouns, which may be either singular or plural, depending on the context. And remember our, our rule. Look at the prepositional phrase that follows the sanam pronoun to determine whether it's singular or plural in this particular case. Here, the sanam pronoun any is followed by the prepositional phrase of the churches or synagogues in town. Churches, synagogues, both of those objects of the preposition of are plural. So the sanam pronoun any is also plural in this particular context. So therefore the pronoun that refers back to any later in the sentence should also be plural there. The sentence should read, no one knows whether any of the churches or synagogues in town will provide space in their buildings for a homeless shelter. Next sentence, either Nigel or her sister didn't finish her or their dinner. Once again, we have to choose either a singular or a plural pronoun. Notice that the singular pronoun, her, is feminine because Nadja and her sister are clearly both female, and so there's no question of his or her. We have to choose either her or their, depending on whether the antecedent is singular or plural. Once again, if you look at the sentence in a general way, you might be tempted to choose the plural pronoun, because after all, Nadja and her sister are both involved in the action here. But the correct answer is her, because the real antecedent is the singular pronoun either. Remember that the indefinite pronoun either is one of the pronouns in the group that would always be considered singular. So since one or the other is being referred to by the singular indefinite pronoun either,
the singular pronoun her is correct rather than the plural pronoun there. Well, so much for the art of agreement. Although people who are mastering English often make mistakes with subject-verb agreement and pronoun-antecedent agreement, I think you can see that actually agreement isn't very difficult to master. It's basically a matter of, first, learning some rules about what kinds of words are singular and what kinds of words are plural, and then, second, knowing where to look. It's a little bit like being an auto mechanic. Picking the correct spark plugs for a particular engine isn't that difficult. You just need to know where to look in the manual to find the specifications that will apply to a particular car. In the same way, once you learn how to look at the sentence and find the subject or find the antecedent, then picking the correct verb or pronoun isn't terribly difficult. Keep practicing these skills, and I'm sure you'll find that they will come more and more naturally to you as time passes. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to speaking with you again on other programs in this grammar series.